Hi. I am Jenny and welcome to FreeJu, the global community of educators. Let me show you why as an educator you should make FreeJu an important part of your teaching and learning practice. A community of teaching practice is important for any educator. On FreeJu you will be able to access CollabEd, which is like LinkedIn but for educators. Here you will be able to connect and network with other educators from all around the world. You can build your own community of teaching practice and or join one of the many other existing groups and learn and share ideas, lesson plans, etc. with each other. Then, for a more formalized approach to professional development, you can go to SkillEd, which is like Netflix for educators. Here, you will be able to access a wide range of courses designed by global experts that will help you to learn about new pedagogical, technical, and soft skills, all related to 21st century education and the future of work. There are more than 20 courses available for free and for more advanced level courses, you can upgrade to the Silver Membership Plan for just 20 US dollars per year and get access to all courses designed by Acadasia. The courses are available in English and in several other Asian languages. And what's more you will receive a free verifiable and tamper-proof digital certificate for each course that you complete. If you have upgraded your membership to the Silver, Gold, or Platinum plans, you also get access to DesignEd, which is like Canva for educators. Here you will find the easiest and fastest way to practice your own instructional design skills and build your own courses. We have pre-integrated several third-party edtech apps like Flipgrid, Canva, Mentimeter, Padlet, H5P, Zoom, etc. right into FreeJu so you can make your courses engaging and fun for your own learners. As you can see, there is a lot you can do on FreeJu as an educator. So what are you waiting for? Go to www.freeju.com and get your very own free lifetime membership today. See you soon on FreeJu. Okay, hello and welcome everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good day to all of you wherever you are in the world. Magandang hapon po to our friends in the Philippines as well. I am Roy Platon, a co-founder of Acad Asia, a Singapore-based uh, mission-driven edtech business, and we're here to empower educators everywhere. So we're very excited and very glad to have all of you, our beloved educators, uh, principals, deans, uh, practitioners in the education space, uh, teachers, and of course, even those who are learning to become teachers, welcome to our weekly webinar Wednesdays, our fireside chat. I'm very excited to see all of you and be with you all again. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce, of course, our moderator for today. Uh, you've seen him last week, and I'll just uh, introduce him again, and he'll be the one to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, I'd like to bring on uh, to, the, to the stream uh, Acad Asia Philippine Academic Manager, Mr. Jake. Aragon. Jake, hi, how are you? Hi, Roy. Doing good. How about you? Pretty fantastic. Excited to get back on the streams again and to be with all our uh, uh, friends and educators here. Very excited to have another uh, uh, webinar today, a short chat. Uh, so I hope all our friends there just relax, sit back, uh, have a little coffee break, and join us on this uh, next uh, hour or so. Okay, right. maybe Jake, please go ahead and introduce our speakers. Okay, thanks, Roy. Uh, again, uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening. Salamat siya. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Wherever you are in the world, welcome to our webinar today entitled How to Enhance Emotional Intelligence in and Out of the Classroom, organized by Acad Asia, the team behind FreeJu, the global community of educators. Uh, in Acad Asia, we have a network of more than 160,000 educators spanning 35 countries across the world. And we couldn't be more excited to have all of you today in this webinar to share thoughts and insights on the very relevant and timely topic of how to enhance emotional intelligence in schools. Uh, teachers, school heads, counselors, guests, parents, we are all struggling with navigating the new and ever, ever seemingly changing world. We are asking students to learn in evolving ways as we struggle to keep up ourselves. Increasing our emotional intelligence is an important part of being a more effective teacher, 
friend, partner, and person. Thank you for joining us today once again as we explore some aspects of how to embark on this journey. To help us gain more perspective on the topic and to learn about practical applications that can be carried out in school or at home to enhance emotional intelligence, we are very fortunate to have with us today two guests who have generously accepted our invitation despite of their very hectic schedules, to share with you their expert thoughts and ideas on emotional intelligence. Let me introduce them. Our first guest today is a family and marital counselor for the Center of Family Ministries here in the Philippines. She's formerly the Director of Guidance at the Asian Institute of Management. And currently, uh, she's an Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center. Currently, she's also Guidance Services Specialist at the University of the Philippines in Diliman. Uh, guests, let's, uh, friends, let's all welcome our first guest from the Philippines, Ms. Maria Elena Eileen Bartolome. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Jay. Good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Hi, happy everyone. to talk about this very relevant topic. Okay, thanks, Eileen. It's nice to have you today, and we're really looking forward to hearing uh, your insights, your thoughts on how teachers can help uh, promote uh, and enhance emotional intelligence inside and outside the classroom. So later we'll touch more on the topic. Uh, let me introduce our second guest for this afternoon. Our second guest is an engineer by training. He has been in tertiary education for more than 30 years. He's a certified trainer in cultural intelligence and is currently the senior advisor Technology Development and Innovation at Nian Polytechnic in Singapore. Uh, friends, let's all welcome Mr. Andrew Sabaratnam. Hi. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Singapore. Um, very happy to be here. Uh, emotional intelligence is a topic that is not talked about, and I think it's important and relevant for this day and age. Okay, thank you, Andrew, for being with us this afternoon. Um, before we go to our uh, fireside chat proper, I'd also like to welcome all uh, the teachers and education professionals in attendance. We're seeing yeah, uh, teachers uh, from all over the Philippines, uh, from uh, Isabella all the way to Zamboanga. Uh, we have teachers from Pakistan and Indonesia uh, also uh, saying hello to the Akad Asia community. Uh, and of course, as we go on, we'll have more and more uh, guests uh, from the region uh, joining us. Uh, so emotional intelligence is experiencing a resurgence, the concept which teaches that there is power in understanding and managing emotions actually first gained popularity decades ago. And the principles behind it have been around for centuries. However, Andrew and Eileen, there's still many who are unsure what emotional intelligence really is and what it looks like in the real world, especially now, where there is just so much going on. Is it just a feel-good set of guidelines? Is it simply the ability to show common sense? Or is it something more? So in order for us to have a baseline understanding, uh, Andrew and Eileen, what is emotional intelligence? Maybe we can start with Eileen. Uh, yes. Um Emotional intelligence means that means the capacity to be aware of, to be in control, to express one's emotions empathically. Um, this is um, this is the base to personal and pro professional success. So it's important to identify one's feelings and emotions to express them properly and appropriately, and to be empathetic of others' feelings, which is very important nowadays, now that we are mostly in online learning. Okay, thank you, Eileen. Uh, how about you, Andrew? Well, uh, I agree with Eileen. Um, emotional intelligence in its basic 
definition is the ability to manage one own, one's own emotions and understand the emotions of others. If I was to give a broader definition, it would be the ability to uh, express and control one's own emotions and understand, interpret and respond to the emotions of others. Uh, interestingly, um, EQ, the interest in EQ started in 1985 when uh, this professor was wondering why is it that some people are more successful than others? You could have people who are highly intelligent but are not very successful in their jobs, whereas those who are moderately intelligent should be successful. And then he discovered that it's not just about IQ, there's this other part about how you manage and control your emotions that adds that adds a new dimension and adds another dimension to, to you in your professional work. And so uh, a lot of interest started in EQ and now uh, and then it got sidelined. But like you said, there's a resurgence now. There's a need to relook at this. Uh, we are becoming too much like robots. We need to uh, really sh express our emotions and understand the emotions of others. Right, and especially for students uh, yes. who are exposed to a lot of automation uh, uh, and, and their experiences will always revolve around efficiency and getting things done quickly. There are instances when they yeah. lose touch of their inner selves and, and uh, seem to not fully uh, have a good grasp or understanding of how to manage or, or deal with their emotions. So thanks, Eileen and Andrew, for, for very clearly explaining that uh, when we talk about emotional intelligence, we're talking about identifying and managing one's emotions uh, so that they can be more productive, right? They can be better uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, they, they can connect with others better uh, and, and function better as well. So thank you. But just like what you think of as traditional intelligence, Andrew, I, and I Everyone possesses a certain degree of emotional intelligence. However, we know that it's very difficult to measure emotional intelligence since tests are inherently subjective and imperfect. Um, with that said, how can students tell how emotionally intelligent they are? Uh, maybe we can start with Andrew this time. Um, well, it's... it's... It's difficult for someone to, I mean, it's difficult for us to tell ourselves someone has to point it out to us. That's why educators are important. But there are certain markers that, that, that will show up for someone who has high EQ. These are people who are, um, they are able to manage themselves. They, 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 are, they, are, they know their strengths and weaknesses. They are very calm in, in, uh, in, in different situations. They... Uh, uh, they, they know how to develop relationships. They, they know how to maintain relationships. They're very collaborative. They are peacemakers. They're the ones who come in and listen to both sides. They're good listeners. They're able to communicate well. They are able to identify their feelings, explain what their feelings mean, and know how their emotions affect the, impact the behavior of others. And they also understand the emotions of other people and know how to identify the emotions of other people and then understand how to handle them. So, but you need an educator with high EQ to make these observations and help the students, especially those with low EQ, to develop. Students with low EQ are impulsive, they're impatient, they, uh, they are very uh, inward looking, they don't care about anybody around them. And they, they, they don't judge correctly. They make wrong judgments because they're not able to figure out the person or the emotions of that person. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Thank you for, for mentioning a few things that the teachers can look into, such as um, you know, students being able to identify their strengths, strengths or weaknesses, that they're creative, calm, they're peacemakers, and they're able to express emotions and understand how the emotions affect others. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I need anything you like. Um, there are tests to measure um, the emotional intelligence of a person. One is the emotional profile index. But um, if you do um, 
if uh, you want to gauge the emotional intelligence of your students, one is the motivation. Motivation is very important because the online learning has been too long. And uh, uh, from my students, they their, emo their motivation is becoming low, lower. So um, motivation means to persist even if you don't like to. If you, even if you don't, if you feel bored, or even if you don't like the the subject, you persist because you think it is important. What is motivation? One is identifying your feelings. What what do you feel? How do you feel? Um, Self awareness is very important, and how to deal with. Difficult emotions. How do you deal with difficult emotions? I want this to do, do, do mindfulness exercises and also meditation. Other another thing is to be able to relate well. That is relationship management. How to relate well with the peers? How to relate well with the teachers? These are measures of how how mature the person is emotionally you can measure their emotional maturity through this and how empathetic they are with their classmates are they willing to help their classmates that is a measure also of emotional intelligence okay thank you uh eileen for sharing some of those uh, insights on what teachers can uh, uh, look into, right, uh, um, uh, in their students to gauge uh, emotional uh, intelligence. You mentioned, Aideen, that uh, one one of the things that uh, educators will have to seriously consider is motivation. And in the time yes. of pandemic, uh, we saw that uh, the level of motivation vary greatly from student to student. Uh, how, how were you able to handle that, Eileen? Like, you would see students, you know, who are very active and who are very uh, participative, but there are some, as you said, whose motivations uh, or motivation levels are very low. How, 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 how did you intervene or support these students who had very low motivations? I intervene through um, giving them, allowing them to have um, goals for short-term goals instead of long-term goals because the environment is different nowadays. Uh, during the day, the, the goal should be per day, can be per day. And when they are able to do their goals, for example, start, start reviewing, um, finish the requirement. If they are able to finish the requirement during the day, then they can reward themselves because it is a small considered as a win. It's a win. It's a victory because they are able to do um, the requirement. Um, just opening the book, um, which they have to study on, is already a small win. If they are able to open the book, read, read the article, that is already a small win. And then they can reward themselves. Reward themselves. Um, by, for example, um, having an ice cream or doing their favorite hobby afterwards. It's uh, the more wins they, they have during the day, the more fulfilling the day is. And then before sleeping, they ha can have a gratitude journal. Write the things that you are grateful for. Uh, tell them, write three things that they are grateful for. Write the things that you were able to do well today. And that will end their day um, with them feeling fulfilled and happy. Okay, thanks very much, Eileen, for those tips. Andrew, would you want to add anything about addressing different levels of motivation among yeah. students? Definitely, uh, goal setting is important. Uh, I think it's there, it, there's this, the, the twin is motivation and perseverance. So we got to get the students motivated and we got to help them to persevere. Setting goals is an ex excellent example. Uh, it, it gives them a sense of accomplishment. So uh, we can set the goals for them, uh, for them or we could ask them to set their own goals and, by, uh, and, and then we could ex uh, examine their goals and say these goals are 
uh, you uh, achievable and go for it. And when they have achieved their goals, uh, we, we praise them, we encourage them, and we tell them, look, you come this far, now let's push the, the, the let's push it one step further. Let's push the boundaries, let's challenge the boundaries and get them going one step after another. Then that motivation and the perseverance will follow. Okay, thanks. What a great insight there, combining uh, motivation and perseverance and helping uh, the students uh, realize that uh, although, you know, uh, the situation can be very overwhelming, can be very daunting for them, as long as the goals that are being set are achievable or small enough for them to have yes. small goals at the end, those will be enough to get them going and to keep them motivated. And so uh, uh, teachers uh, who are watching, that's a very good strategy that we can all apply as we support them uh, in, in cope with their academic work. Uh, I, 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 need to, uh, I need to add that uh, the, the, the teachers have to take, make a considered effort to keep track of the students uh, and have a, a private journal of who are doing well and who are left behind and those who need more attention. Uh, you, you, you can't just yes. let them go and, and be motivated by themselves. It's not going to happen. Yes, I agree with Andrew. Um, those who are a little shy or are not participating, I encourage them and always affirm um, the little yeah. things that the students do. That will help them in their increase their motivation. Thanks, Andrew and Eileen. All right, now, a variety of factors will definitely affect one's ability to understand and manage emotions, including genes and even the environment. An individual's formative years also play an important role. Research shows, however, that a person can grow these abilities. For example, uh, Stanford psychology professor Carol Dweck has shown the advantages of having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. In other words, individuals who believe their talents can be developed through hard work, effective strategy, and feedback from others, or elements that comprise growth mindset, tend to achieve more than those who believe that their talents are innate gifts with uh, limited development potential or fixed mindset. Given this, Andrew and Eileen, uh, how can emotional intelligence be taught inside and outside the classroom? Are there things that teachers in the frame of being an educator have to keep in mind uh, when it comes to actually teaching uh, emotional intelligence? Uh, maybe we can start with Eileen. Um, I think that um, talents can, are we um, basing on the growth mindset, we can um, identify the strength of each student, write the strength of each student, and let them do that, uh, do where they are good in. For example, they're good in arts. Um, make, make your lesson plans more creative. Instead of just writing, let them draw, let them paint. Um, allow them to express their talents, and whenever they they are able to do that. Let them show, show, parent show and tell uh, in the class. Allow them to show their talents in front of the class um, so that others can, can also affirm and encourage them. That will be um, increasing their strength, increasing their strength. Andrew? Uh, there are a few ways. Of course, one way would be to have a program called social and emotional learning. Right. But I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm against having programs where it's just one of the many subjects they have to learn. And then they learn it in isolation. Um, if the school could have character education, and when they have character education, it's not a, a, a subject by itself but it is weaved into everything they do. So if the school has decided on five or six principles that they want the students to uh, emulate uh, respect, responsibility, resilience, integrity, compassion, gratitude, just say these are six 
uh, characteristics they want the students to exhibit, then uh, in, infused into the curriculum, there should be teachable moments. So when they're teaching, whether it be maths or science, there should be teachable moments where the students are allowed to express this in way of collaboration, in terms of problem solving, in terms of being empathetic to others, uh, partnering a strong, uh, 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 a more a stronger student academically stronger student partnering a weaker student and helping the student that will uh, help the students develop empathy and, and a form of of uh, of uh, care for their fellow peers um, the other way would be uh, to get them to uh, volunteer uh, for community services um, and you know tell them you got to make when it comes to volunteering it involves making sacrifices and their sacrifices but through that volunteering they are learning the uh, learning about other people about uh, caring about other people that not everybody is well off as they are and uh, that, that 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 develops their emotional intelligence the other one is something with which i have done um, we have a week called rag week r a g it means random acts of gratitude so they they go up to a cleaner they go up to uh, uh, someone who's working in a food stall they give the person a flower and say thank you for the work you're doing can we have a short interview with you uh, on, about your life and your experiences and then they, they they capture a photograph and they put it in facebook and they tell the story about this guy how they met and what he does uh, so it's this kind of communication that helps to build and, and develop them uh, some of the things uh, 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 staff can do, it's really, really left to these. There's so many things you can do to, to infuse and inculcate uh, emotional intelligence. Right. Thanks, Andrew. And it, 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 I, I'd like to go back to the point that you made about not learning emotional intelligence in isolation, meaning teachers uh, are not encouraged right, to teach it separately, right? but, but to integrate it into the curriculum and into the activities of the different subjects that the students are already taking. Right? So call it, call it teachable right, moments. Right, right. Yeah. So whether it's a science class or even a mathematics class, a language class, uh, or even social studies, there are many yeah. opportunities able to design learning activities or experiences that will still touch on emotional intelligence. Yeah. That's one more thing. That's one more thing. Uh, you can actually uh, put some of the elements of EQ in your assessment. Like for example, uh, when, a, when they're doing group work, you put a, a grade for team for being a team player. The peers will assess each other on whether they were a good team player or not. The other one is assignments. If you pass up your assignment late, you're going to lose marks because it's important to be everybody. You got to be fair with everyone. Everybody's passing up at the same time. You don't have any privileges about passing it up late, so you're going to be penalized. So you could actually have that in your assessment as well. Mm -hmm. um, then, also, yeah, um, ahead, also you if you're teaching literature, you can also ask how does this person feel? Um, how does this? What is the common emotion of this student of the character? in the story um one is uh, this one is to integrate it to the lesson for example history or literature um also uh Kate games in class for example it's important uh you know emojis like uh the laughter the laughter emoticon the sad emoticon you can start and the, the start the class with how do you feel today? And then they can draw an emoticon of how representing how they feel today. For for empathy, so that they will know how to to strengthen empathy in the, within the class. They can mirror, for example, uh, uh, pair them, and then one will do actions, and then the other one can imitate the action. And then um, ask, ask the second one, how does your partner feel? Mirroring. You can learn empathy through the mirroring exercise. Okay, thanks, yes, Aideen. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. those are fantastic yeah. ideas. Andrew, go ahead. 
Yes, so yes, uh, uh, exactly what Eileen I said. Uh, literature and history are great because uh, you start to ask questions about, especially in literature, why did that person feel that way? Uh, what made that person act that way? How, why did that person react to that person's feelings? Uh, those kind of questions will get the students thinking about feelings and emotions. Um, so th those are great. Um, uh, uh, one, one movie that comes to mind, an animated movie that's worth watching is Inside Out. It has about 26 different types of emotions there. Uh, and it talks about this girl who's going to leave her home She's migrating with her parents to another place and all the mixed emotions she feels. And these emotions have conversations inside here. They're, it's worth watching. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew and Eileen. Actually, I have a, a, a daughter. She's six years old and she's in Tinder. And, and uh, for the whole year, uh, she's been attending online classes. But what I noticed from uh, the way her classes are being run is that before the teacher jumps into the lessons scheduled for the day, there will always be a time for emotions check. And, and whether yes. it's represented by emojis or emoticons or, uh, or a rain cloud or a sunny day uh, or popular... Yes. Uh, Cartoon characters, maybe from Encanto or the popular, the, the the movies that they're uh, familiar with now. The kids uh, have developed that habit to share with their teacher and their classmates how they're feeling on a daily basis. At first, I thought, you know, they just they <laughs> say that they're always a sunny day, that they're always feeling good and ecstatic and, and excited about about being in class. But I, I also saw, because I'm sitting beside my daughter every day, I also saw that some kids would really say that they're not in a good space or that yeah. there, 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 there are many things that are bothering them or making them anxious. And, and, you know, and that gives the teacher the entry point to be able to process uh, the emotions that are being experienced by the student. And at the same time, for the other classmates who are also in class, to understand where their yeah. classmates are coming from and later on to encourage them because they've also developed encourage. the practice or habit of supporting their classmates who are not feeling so good about uh, themselves at a certain time in class. So yeah. these are fantastic yeah. tips from Andrew and Eileen that, yeah. that we, can, we can use. Uh, Andrew, anything you'd want to add? No, no. So that, that, the, the reason why that is happening is because uh, your daughter's teacher has a high EQ and realizes the importance of EQ <laughs> and, and, and for academic success. Exactly. Yeah. Right, right. It is, Aileen, right? Important, it is important also yeah, for teachers to validate the emotions. For example, they feel sad. Don't say, you have to be happy. Um, yeah, exactly. It is important yeah. to be with them. Yeah, you know the story of Eeyore and um, Winnie the Pooh. Um, you, you don't you need not say you have to be positive you have to mm. feel happy all the time what you have to do is accompany accompany them um validate remember teachers we validate and we be creative in our classroom in the classroom um while teaching we can use games while teaching we can use different exercises a whole there are many different exercises in google you can look for it there Okay, thanks, Eileen. Yeah. Okay, actually, uh, so actually, actually, if we if we were to look at our own lives and and, yes. and uh, when we are growing up, you can tell who are your good teachers and who were your bad teachers. The, the bad teachers are always those with low EQ. Uh, I I I, rec uh, I, right. I recall uh, when I was learning driving for the first time, my my driving instructor was so strict. He 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 picked every mistake I made. And and, and 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 I felt like I was the worst driver ever existed, and and I was so demoralizing. And as as the time for my exam uh, driving test approached closer and closer, I had no confidence at all. So just before the test, I pulled out. I I stopped the the lessons and I pulled out, and uh, because I had zero confidence, he had he had completely shut me down, and uh, he texted me and said. Why did you stop? You were ninety-three percent ready, and I asked myself, "Why didn't you tell me this earlier?" You always made me feel like a zero. <laughs> you see, so some people they have so low, low EQ, they do not know. They think that they are scolding you, uh, they are they are making you a better student, but they are not. 
it completely shattered me, you know. So the next lecture, the next sorry, the next driving instructor I got was so good, so encouraging. Uh, I passed first time, you know. I went for my test and passed first time because of that. So, so high EQ, low EQ makes a world of difference to your student. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for for sharing that, Andrew. And I'm sure the teachers will also be able to identify some experiences, very similar, very closely associated to that. Uh, that that, as you said, really spelled the world of difference, right? When it comes to learning motivations, when it comes to uh, the overall experience um, with a teacher or with a subject. Okay. Now. Emotional intelligence uh, helps students uh, cope with emotions in the academic environment. Um, typically, students can feel anxious about exams, feel disappointed with poor results, feel frustrated when they try hard but cannot achieve what they want, or feel bored when the subject matter is not interesting. Being able to regulate these emotions uh, so they do not interfere with learning uh, help students achieve. Uh, in this light, Andrew and Eileen, um, what are practical tips and strategies uh, for schools on a school-wide level uh, to be able to promote or enhance uh, emotional intelligence? Because we've talked about tips that teachers may use inside a classroom. Uh, on their own level. But let's say on a whole school uh, view or in a whole school uh, uh, perspective, um, are there initiatives or, or efforts that schools can take uh, maybe on a policy, on, a, on a, an entire institution uh, view in order to better enhance or promote emotional intelligence in their institutions? What are your thoughts on this? Eileen? Uh, one is um, the a tutorial program. Uh, you can have a tutorial program for those who are um, less good in, in a particular subject. Um, your, the, your student who are better can help them. Another is the learning team. You can you can have a learning team, for example, of uh, composed of three students, and then they can help each other. And one should be good, very good in that subject. He or she can help the other two. That's a learning team. They can exchange ideas and, while supporting each other. They not only develop intellectually, but they also develop socially socially um, they get feedback from one another they can discuss and then they can stimulate one another um, create learning teams and tut tutorials for the for those who are having a hard time in though in diffi their difficult subjects oh yeah thanks Eileen for those suggestions and ideas uh, but uh, we'd also like to know if uh, the idea of promoting or enhancing emotional intelligence um, is deeply rooted in the conversations of, of school administrators or teachers. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Eileen? Is, is it given much priority from your experience working with different schools? Uh, is it given much attention uh, to ensure that you know these practices are in place? Or or there, is there still a lot of room for improvement that can be done in terms of establishing uh, the, the strengthening of emotional intelligence in schools? The, uh, in schools, the intellectual side, the intellectual mind is given more attention, given more <laughs> affirmation than the we tend to hide the emotional side. Um, this has to be paid more attention to, especially with this, with this setting, with the conditions around us, with the pandemic, the COVID-19 crisis, with the war in Ukraine um, and Russia. The, the emotional side have, has to be given um, more priority nowadays because there is a crisis also an emotional crisis happening 
um, cases of anxiety. There are many cases of psychiatric problems developing, and the more serious ones is self harm. Hence, um, we we also have to practice this, this among ourselves. We teachers have to practice this among ourselves so we can um, give this to our students. Okay, thanks, Eileen. Uh, Andrew, your, your thoughts? Uh, in, in Singapore, uh, we do not give uh, credit solely for academic excellence. Um, uh, in my institution, for example, um, you can the top student gets a gold, then you got a silver, and then you got those with commendation. And it's not just based on academic excellence. We look at their contributions in CCA, in contributing, to giving back to society, uh, community services, uh, leadership roles they have played, uh, how they have uh, uh, worked together in groups and, and done something uh, meaningful. All that is taken into account as part and parcel of the whole the holistic learning experience of the student. However, um, when you start to do that, then of course students will then play the game. You know, they'll they'll make sure they do enough of the CCAs and committee service to garner enough points to to come to so that uh, they can be recognized as a top student. So uh, what we do is we the other what we have now done is we have introduced service learning. Service learning as a curriculum as a module. Uh, students, every student has to do service learning, but here is here's the interesting thing: the students work in groups. They go out to the community. They 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 have conversations. They look at the problem. They come back. They discuss the problem among themselves and try to find a solution, and then uh, work out a solution and give it to the to the people. So there is that kind of collaborative work going on. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a pass-face module, so as long as you do it correctly, you get a pass, and, and that's fine. But because all the students are doing it, uh, uh, and they, they is, uh, they are getting some of this, uh, uh, these experiences, and they are getting to understand the need uh, to, to connect emotionally with other people. The other thing is, within, within the, uh, the student group, uh, when the students come together, it, it's good to for us to be facilitators and not instructors. We, we should allow them to go and do what they want to do. Let them have an opinion. Listen to them, say, uh, give you suggestions. And you, you know, students are giving me suggestions. And I listen to it and say, it's not going to work. But I let them go ahead. I said, so I ask them probing questions. What happens if you do this, if you do that? And they'll tell me what they want to do. I said, okay, let's give it a shot. And then they'll come back and tell me it didn't work. Then I'll, I'll have a conversation. Why didn't it work? So... I teach them that it's okay to fail because you can always get up and start again. So be facilitators, don't be instructors. Don't tell them, no, that's not going to work. I want you to do that. It kills it. The third thing I'd like to add is when the students form a group, uh, let the students among themselves work out a contract. That means they will say that if you're going to be in this group, this is the minimum we require from anyone. If you don't meet the minimum requirement, the group can ask you to leave, and then you've got to go and find another group. So it's a kind of a contract that is signed by the students, uh, and they, 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 and that's how they get to work together and manage one another. So there's some other ways uh, that could be done. Right. Thanks, thanks, Andrew, for mentioning about service learning and then some of these practical strategies. Uh, of course, our, our, our teachers in the audience can also learn more about service learning. Uh, and how in, even in group work, uh, there can be rules or guidelines in place uh, that will also help promote and enhance emotional learning among themselves. So thanks again, Eileen and Andrew, for those very useful, very practical tips. Now, qualities of emotionally intelligent teachers uh, this time may include their ability to perceive and manage their own and their students' emotions, demonstrate empathy and manage behavioral changes. Uh, in view of this, uh, let's talk about teachers. How can educators um, also develop emotional intelligence among themselves? Uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, you know, tips and strategies for students, but uh, from one educator to another, uh, Eileen and Andrew, uh, what are you know, top of mind strategies and tips that we can uh, give our, our teachers or education professionals who are joining us today? Eileen, go ahead. Um, a very important um, thing to do 
for, for, for the teachers is to do self-care. We are giving much of ourselves to our students. We are counselors. We listen. We listen to them. Um, we have to have uh, boundaries and also um, re replenish ourselves by um, uh, having self-care exercises like mindfulness exercises, meditation, whatever you want to do. Um, we can also meet. When we meet, we can share of our experiences, uh, what happened to us during uh, the COVID-19 crisis, the pandemic crisis. What happened? Um, if someone, uh, if a, a relative died, we can listen and then support him or her. Uh, that is um, that is giving empathy to fellow teachers, and that is also strengthening. Sometimes we are as drained as our students. I'm talking about online learning here. It's hard to do community service when we are working at home. When the students are still on online learning, it's hard to do community service, to do field work. Um, we can do this online, online, um, listen to each other. We can listen to each other and provide support. Remember, um, self-care is one of the most important thing that we can do during uh, within these conditions. With, considering the conditions nowadays. Thanks, Eileen. Andrew, how about you? If we want to increase our EQ, um, first thing is uh, self-reflection. We need to be self-aware. We need to be able to identify our feelings, understand why we feel that way, and, 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 and ask ourselves, if I feel this way, how is it affecting those around? How is it affecting my behavior? How is it affecting those around me? Uh, th that's important because normally a person with low, I, uh, low EQ, when you ask him or her, how do you feel? It's either good or bad. They don't mm -hmm. have an emotional vocabulary. They only have two words. I feel good, I feel bad. But someone high e EQ could say, I'm feeling slightly anxious now and I the reason why I feel anxious is because I, I'm going to get my medical report and I'm quite concerned about the outcome. But I know this is unfounded because uh, I don't know what's, uh, I'm, I'm worrying over nothing. So the person can explain what they're going through. See? Uh, whereas whereas uh, uh, a person with low EQ will say, I don't know, like, I, just, I, I don't know, I just feel bad. That's mm -hmm. it. You know, and it can't express itself. So that's important. Empathy, uh, understanding how others feel. Uh, uh, understanding why they feel that way is important because once you can do that and you can empathize with them, then you, you can have you 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 are able to build better relationship with these people, and 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 you are seen to be more accommodating and and are more approachable. Uh, active listening, you you got to be an active listener, uh, and when students see lecturers, teachers being active listeners, they will also uh, want to uh, emulate that. Uh, communicate clearly. Uh, stay positive, no matter what the circumstances. Always try to look at the bright side of things. Don't paint a gloomy picture. You'll be surrounded with toxic people, you know, and then they'll say bad things and they may want you to lash out on them. But mm. uh, a person with high EQ is able to take a step back, stay calm, understand that this person is having a bad day, uh, let it be, because it doesn't make any, it's not going to help if both people lash out at each other uh, mm. and, and, and stay positive. And uh, be open-minded uh, to be able to listen to people. Don't judge them. Uh, give them an opportunity to speak uh, uh, and, and listen to them. And, and, and don't, don't comment, but empathize with them. Say, I know how you feel. Perhaps I've never been in that situation, but it must be terrible how you feel. And I just wanted you to know that even though I can't help you, I'm here by your side and I will sit with you and, and, and wait this out with you. Uh, Listen to feedback. Take um, uh, positive feedback is great. If someone does uh, gives you com critical comments, take it in your stride to improve, and always stay calm under pressure. Of course, all this is easier said than done, but uh, if you keep practicing it and 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 and, and be self-aware, in time your IQ will just go better, it could get better and better. Yes. Thanks. Um, and I in, or 
Yes, in order to stay positive, like what Andrew said, um, we have to take care of ourselves. Um, in taking care of ourselves, in order to develop our own emotional intelligence, we have to know techniques to take care of ourselves. One is um, the mindfulness technique. The Another is meditation. Another is prayer. Another is journaling. For example, uh, give three things that I am grateful for today. You can also reward yourself whenever you do something um, good. When you feel bad, you can share it with another person. It's close to you. Or you can go to um, replenish yourself by being with nature. Um, there are so many techniques to do um, techniques to do in order to um, have self care. Remember that it is important to um, take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others as well. I I I, I, I echo, echo what uh, Irene said. It's 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 easy to be immersed in work. Today, a friend was telling me that. Uh, because she is recovering at home and she's not well. She says, I, I feel moody because I'm not doing anything. All I'm doing is reading and, and, and sleeping and nothing else. I said, you know, we, it's not often we get to do nothing. I think it's a luxury when you can sit down and say, I'm not going to do anything today. I'm just going to rest and relax. And, 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 and as Eileen said, just meditate or, or if you're a religious person spend time in in in, in, in content, contemplative prayer uh and soak in the environment uh i uh, uh when i take leave i spend half a day either in solitude uh in a silent room to be with myself or i find a quiet co corner in a coffee shop with my book and sit quietly and I have no regrets. You know, we are always living in this world where we need to rush and do things. We forget to rest. We forget how to just sit down and, and, and relax and, and do nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something we need to do. Okay. More. Another, thing, yeah. another thing is you can also debrief, do the briefing exercises. You yeah. meet with your fellow teachers and you do the briefing exercises. Um, how did you feel during the semester? How mm. can you feel better? Um, what do I think? Um, what is good about you? Um, affirm each other. What is good about you? There are so many ways in order to debrief, do the briefing sessions once in okay. a while. All right. Thanks, uh, Eileen and Andrew, for reminding our teachers uh, to take care of themselves uh, uh, and, and not feel bad, right, Andrew, when they're not doing actually anything? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> right. Yes. When you're actually allotting time uh, for self-care, you know, to, to renew themselves and to re-energize themselves. Don't feel right. bad, dear teachers. When you have that opportunity, do take it, right? And, and uh, it's really what you'll need to keep you going. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Switch off your email and switch off your WhatsApp when you're resting, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Set the yeah. devices aside, mm -hmm. right? And just focus mm -hmm. and look at yourself. Hmm. All right. Okay. These are very great tips and insights that we're getting from our speakers. Now it's time to get some questions uh, from the audience, uh, Andrew and Eileen. And, and I'll be asking a few uh, that, that we've uh, um, selected from uh, those that have been posted by uh, our audience who are following us on StreamYard, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Uh, the first question is... Um, Aideen and Andrew, who has higher emotional intelligence, men or women? Can that <laughs> actually be determined? And uh, how do you spot if a person has low emotional intelligence? So there are two questions there. Is there really a way to distinguish men from women in terms of emotional intelligence? And how do we spot individuals with low uh, EI or emotional intelligence? I, I think uh, EQ is gender, gender blind. <laughs> Right. intelligence one is yeah. no self control yeah. no mm -hmm. go ahead Eileen yes. okay uh, no, one is no self control um, okay. we cannot really say if um, the higher um, men or the women yeah. have higher emotional intelligence be what, um, the difference is that women can express more because it's a cultural thing um, women are allowed to cry 
in a public setting, women are allowed to um, talk about their emotions more than men, while men have to hide their emotions. Um, I think it's in the... It dep- depends on the person. It depends yeah. on the discipline of the person. I see men with very high emotional intelligence. I see women with very high emotional intelligence. Um, there are five. Five. Um, you can you can spot people with low emotional intelligence depending on self awareness. Are they aware of themselves? Are they able to to regulate, control their emotions? How do they manage their relationship, their social skills? Empathy. Can they help? Can they encourage? Can they perceive the emotions of others and respond appropriately? And lastly is motivation. When you easily give up, that means that um, there's a lot of developing uh, that is needed when the person easily doesn't have grit at all. Thanks, Eileen. Andrew, how about you? Yeah, well, okay. Yeah, I uh, agree. I, I do not think there's a distinction about whether one is one gender is higher in EQ than the other. And I, I agree, and Eileen is uh, probably ladies are able to express better. Uh, and I, I would I would tell men that you, is, you should never be afraid to cry. I think sometimes crying and, and you know yes. when you lose someone, spending time mourning for the loss is important for us. We yes. need to spend that time, uh, uh, and sometimes we just suppress it. Um, what are the uh, qualities of a high a person with high EQ and low EQ? Um, low, low EQ people are always immersed. They are always. It's about them. It's about what they can get out of, of the system. What they are, it's about. They, they 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 don't have any care of the surrounding. Uh, and a low EQ student will be someone who will say, you know, it is my right. I'm a student here. I paid my fees. Uh, why aren't mm-hmm. you giving me what I want? And those <laughs> are students with low EQ. Um, uh, high, uh, so a high EQ will come and will come and say, you know, I, I I really want to do this course. I understand it's full. Is there any way that uh, I can be considered, or is there something else I could do? Or what what should I do? You know, there, there, there's a difference. When when I travel in a in a taxi in Singapore, if the driver is a, a, a non a Chinese driver, uh, I can tell whether he's got high EQ or low EQ. If his radio is tuned to Chinese music. He doesn't care that I don't understand Chinese. He just listens. Then there are some who see me and they turn it to English music. So you mm-hmm. see, there is a difference. So we will be able to spot those with low EQ and high EQ. Uh, high EQ people think about those around them. They are able to empathize. Low EQ don't care. They, they, mm-hmm. It's about themselves, me, myself, and I. That's it. Remember that it's, it is also hard to judge. As a psychologist, it's hard to judge from the externally. Because we do not know the ex, um, exact um, condition of the person he or she might be grieving. Mm-hmm. It's hard. It's difficult. Yeah. The emotions are more intense, are more are deeper. Mm-hmm. So please uh, let us not judge mm-hmm. um, too harshly. Um, let us study their conditions first. Yeah. So, so when you see someone who is not behaving well, if you have high EQ you're able to tell the difference of whether the person is having a bad day or the person is a bad apple. <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you, uh, Andrew and Eileen. Next question. Um, we, en- we often encounter students who are extremely shy mm. and have social anxiety. How can teachers deal with them? Um encouraging affirming also give them some easy questions Mm -hmm. rather than questions that are very hard to answer give them easy question and then affirm at once affirm at once um there are persons who would need the guidance counselors there are guidance counselors here you can refer them to the guidance counselors also Okay, thanks, Aileen. Andrew, your thoughts? Um, uh, we have to take baby steps. Uh, we cannot have one size fit all. For those who are, ex- who are able to accelerate, we give them more. For those who are not able to catch up, we give them 
as as Eileen said, uh, small uh, small uh, small jobs to do, and we always uh, give them affirmation. Um, sometimes it's good if, if you're dealing with a kid. So, uh, what is good is to have a kind of a ladder, uh, a diagram of a ladder, and for very, uh, for certain number of steps, they they that for every uh, assignment they finish, they go one rung up. And after a few rungs, there is a prize for them. Then a few more rungs, a prize. And they can physically see this ladder and, and, and their name is there. You know, I, I mean, you're on ladder number five, ladder number six. And they, it will motivate them to keep going up and up to reach the final prize. So there, there are things that can be done to motivate a student. And know their talents also. Let them show their talents and let them shine. Yeah. And when they shine, they will... Uh, Get more, um, develop more self confidence. Yeah, uh, uh, that, 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 that's true. So, so we we all study in different ways, and so we when we when as an educator, when we want to assess them, we must have different ways of assessing them. Don't just be, uh, don't just do multiple choice or long uh, paper exercise. There are other ways of going out or, or, or collaboration or doing a show and tell or doing a poster design. Uh, those who are visually connected would like to do a poster. Those who are linguistically connected would like to do a show and tell uh, or a presentation. So you should you know, have variety so that they can uh, show off their talents. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Andrea and Eileen. Uh, we have another uh, question here uh, from a teacher in the audience. Most of my students uh, come from underprivileged or marginalized families, or from the low uh, socioeconomic group, and they demonstrate very low motivation levels. Uh, do you have any pieces of advice on how to motivate them, uh, especially when they have a, hard, a difficult time recentering themselves, or when they're finding themselves getting farther and farther from finding any motivation? Uh, so from um, your experience what I do or is talk to them. go ahead Aileen. Yes. As a teacher and a and a guidance counselor too, I talk to the students who mm -hmm. are financially challenged and who have no motivation. If they are financially challenged, maybe you can um ask how he can be helped. And um, maybe there is an office who can give laptops or give financial aid or other many. There are many ways in order to raise funds. Uh, if the Wi-Fi connectivity is hard for them, um, help them get get those things, the material things. And also, the more important thing is to talk to them one on one because they will not tell it in class. They will tell it. Uh, they will um, disclose their problems to you, and you can address them properly. Thanks, Aileen. Uh, Andrew, your thoughts? Well, um, I suppose the 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 motiva motivation level of students differ from country to country. Uh, it'll be different in Singapore. Um, it's said that sometimes we had to put all the students in one class and so the lecturer has a task of, of teaching of making sure the syllabus is finished and then having to deal with those who can cope and those who cannot cope it's not very easy and then if you separate the students then you end up uh categorizing them as oh you're the weaker group so you need more care and that doesn't help them uh i would do uh, what eileen has suggested have a conversation with them it's it's have a chat and and, and that chat well, it's like you asking the student, what is it you like to do in life? Uh, uh, it's not to advise the student, but to ask leading questions where the student actually will come with the answer. It says, oh, so in order to do this, I need to do that, 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 that. Then you say, yeah, let's go for it. And then you also find out from the student, what is it that you're good at? You know, what is it that you like to do? And if a student has a certain talent, that should also be developed. I mean, we always think that, you know, school is the end all of the all things. You, you must finish your education. But today, you, some of the most successful people are dropouts. Steve Jobs, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bill Gates, they're all school dropouts. But they, they have high EQ and they succeeded. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I would think uh, that uh, normally it's the students from poorer backgrounds that exhibit better, higher EQs than those from well-to-do families. Because these people understand what it means to be in need. 
and they can empathize with other people. It's how then do we maximize that and, and take that to the next level? Uh, they got high EQ, help them to cope with their studies, uh, consider them student at risk and, and, and figure out how you can help them go up the next level. And, and it, it's going to be hard work for a, a teacher, but that's our calling as an educator. We want our students to be better than us. So we will give our best. Uh, uh, in addition uh, to what, in addition to Andrew's insight, uh, um, you can formulate, allow the student to formulate goals. What do you want to be in yep. a year's time? What do you want to be in a month's time? How about five um, goal setting? Um, kung if they are hard up financially, you can ask them, would you like to help their parents, your parents? Would you want to be better off than your parents? Then we can do this. Just give them small steps. Give them small uh, goals, short-term goals, in order to achieve their objectives. Okay, thanks, Eileen and Andrew. We're getting a lot of uh, good questions from the audience. So here's another one. What are your thoughts on giving passing grades or too much consideration to students uh, whom we know have tried uh, answering uh, online learning modules but end up with poor results? Uh, do we need to give them too much consideration just to encourage them to continue trying? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, maybe, Andrew, we can start with you this time. This is the, the trouble when we have a, a fixed system and our assessment is fixed. And then everybody is it becomes a slave to that assessment. If we have the flexibility of changing the way we assess students, then by all means do it. For example, I, I have in my assessment, I do poster design. I said, I want you to design a poster and uh, the poster should be eye-catching and have minimum words to tell me what to, to, to give me that message. And that requires quite a bit of thinking, you know, because students are used to putting a lot of words and I want them to tell. So poster design is one way, uh, one form of assessment. Uh, other forms of assessment is uh, show and tell or mm -hmm. build a prototype. And, and, and when it comes to building prototypes, it's okay to fail. You know, you tell them it's okay to make mistakes because you're going to just show your prototype and then we can talk about it. Uh, um, don't just stick to pen and paper, but of course, online it becomes difficult, so you tend to do online exercises. But there's nothing to stop you from uh, using uh, other forms or other apps like Padlet for them to express themselves or using a Mentimeter to participate in surveys or, 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 or other, other apps that are available. I think there's so many different apps there that allow us to assess students differently from the, the, the usual way of quizzes and, 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 and summative and formative uh, exercises. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, absolutely. Teachers, this is an invitation actually for teachers to relook, right, uh, or revisit the nature and design of their assessments. And mm. if, if it's... Uh, uh, if there are opportunities or entry points for teachers to also be able to help support or measure emotional intelligence there, then go ahead and redesign uh, the formative and summative assessments that are being administered. Okay, there's another question here. Uh, how can a nation that has a high cost of mental health treatment be more open to actually and realistically addressing mental health issues? Uh, in the absence of government support, how do you think schools can contribute to addressing these concerns on the mental health uh, condition of students, especially in the virtual classroom setting? I think we've touched on this a bit earlier, but if you'd like to add anything on that uh, as to how schools can come in and support you know, mental wellness or mental health programs for students, uh, please uh, go ahead and, and share your ideas, uh, Andrew and Eileen. Um, you can have mental health responders first before the guidance counselors. Um, these can be the teachers. These can be the teachers, the advisors. Um, who can who can listen? At least listen to the the students. Second is we have we have the National Mental um, Center Center for Mental Health, which offers free 
free um, psychiatrist, free tre treatment. And um, after the mental, the first, the responders, uh, we can talk to our students and we can have activities inside the class to address the emotional state of our students or of, of a certain student. We can do it ourselves. If not, we can go to the guidance counselors and then the, the Center for Mental Health also. Thank okay. you. Okay, Eileen. Andrew, how about you? Uh, well, uh, uh, it would be good if the, 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 the institution can make sure that all teachers, all educators go through basic counseling uh, training. That's important. That is your first line of defense. So in the class, you're able to spot students who are having issues. Um, they, they will be the first line. And then the, they can then connect. And the school must recruit. Uh, if they really want to help the, the mentally challenged students, they must recruit uh, student counselors. Uh, to be there to, uh, so that they can direct the students there to the counselor and the counselor will have a private confidential conversation with the student, if necessary, with the parents. And these student counselors can connect with the NGOs and all the other uh, uh, associations that will, can help the students. They will have the connections. Uh, and, and everything is done in confidence uh, so that the student will not feel threatened, will not feel exposed. <laughs> People are always worried that once they're branded as having mental problems, that's the end of them. Uh, it's not. It's just another illness. Uh, but this is something that uh, uh, the lecturers must understand and must be able to empathize with the students and do that. Um, so first line of defense, all lecturers go through uh, uh, um, uh, uh, that counseling training, uh, have student counselors, and... Um, Make sure that the student counselors are able to connect with the others. Having all said that, said that, bear in mind that even lecturers can have mental issues. They should also have the opportunity to go to these counselors if they need to. Actually, yes, I agree. Yeah, yeah. That, that leads yeah. to the next question, our second mm -hmm. to the last question. Mm -hmm. um, will it also be feasible to allow guidance counselors to debrief or process teachers in order to support them in addressing their emotional and mental health. Uh, yes, Eileen, go ahead. We have sessions for teachers at UP. We have um, sessions to listen to the teacher's concern, to teach them uh, techniques in order to take care of themselves, to teach basic, basic counseling skills. The teacher should also know how to do counseling, basic counseling skills. Um, the counselor should have also have counselors for them. Um, you can have um, you can also ask the opinion. You can also seek the help. Counselors seek the help of other counselors or other mental health specialists. Okay, thanks, Eileen. Andrew. You could, uh, to add to what Eileen has said, you could also have a hotline to the counselors. So lecturers, if they want to just pick up, call the number and they make an appointment, at least they have the assurance that they're going to talk to someone. Okay. All right. So thank you. And finally, should be uh, a go ahead, Eileen. It should be a collaborative effort of everyone, not just the counselors, mm. the teachers. Um, the me mental health should be a priority nowadays and it should be a collaborative effort uh, peer counselors teachers no. prin the principals and everyone even the nurses if you have nurses in schools um, yeah. should know how to help the students okay all right thank you Eileen and finally our uh, last question for this chat um, what can families at home do to help enhance emotional intelligence of, of children. Uh, I guess this is also coming from teachers who would want to work with the parents or their partners at home to help strengthen emotional intelligence. I know this is an entirely different uh, discussion, but if there are some uh, tips or practical strategies that we can also share with our audience on how emotional intelligence can also be promoted at home, it will be of great help uh, to our teachers. Uh, your thoughts? Maybe we can start with Andrew. 
it's, it's not an easy question because yeah. uh, um, especially from the uh, lower income, they are stressed and 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 uh, there's if, if the money is not coming in and there's a lot of concern and, and uh, the, the kids pick up the vibes from the par from the parents they see how the parents behave and they also behave that way so it's quite difficult and you it's quite difficult to go to parents and, and tell them uh, uh, how that can be changed because they got their own issues the, to me the only way is at school when the students at school or, or conversing or communicating with the teacher uh, online that's the opportunity for a teacher to undo any any wrong uh, any uh, um, wrong uh, uh, things that were picked up from the parents, try to correct it by, by bringing them together and, and, and infusing positive, uh, the right forms, the right elements of, uh, of EQ. Um, I, I wouldn't know how to deal with the parents because that, that's a different ballgame altogether. Maybe, Eileen, you can shed some light. Um, the most important thing to do is to have quality time with your mm -hmm. children. It does not have to be a long, long time. It it can be a short time, like dinner time. Um, when they come home, ask them how what how do you feel about school, and then really listen and validate. How do you feel? Um, allow them to have a, a long list of vocabulary on emotions, so it's not also I feel bad, I feel good, um, I feel anxious, I feel sad, I feel happy, I feel I'm excited, and then. Listen, listen to them. Listen to your children and have quality time. Like, um, um, do, do some games with them, like Scrabble or other games so that you can connect with your children. It's important to connect because you are the support uh, system. You are the, more, no, the most important support, support system of your students. Uh, I reckon that I, I think during during this COVID period, uh, a lot of uh, schools, I believe, uh, give the uh, assignments to uh, uh, assignment booklets to the students. They take it home. They do it at home. Chances are the parents are sitting with the students, stressed, trying to answer the questions with the students. Uh, and so, uh, and, and in the mind of the parents, it's all about getting good grades so that the students can do better than them. That's 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 their greatest desire. Perhaps the school could also get the parents to come together and have chats with them and, 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 and form some encouragement and, 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 and a recognition for what they're doing for the kids in collaboration with, with the school in, in bringing education uh, to their children. Uh, a form of, uh, of recognition for the parents for the hard work they've done will help. I remember that the, the teacher can only do so much. Yeah. Uh, the most important support system can come from the parents. Um, give them quality time, give them presence, give them validation, and affirm them, support them. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew and Eileen, for all the wonderful insights, tips, uh, and pieces of advice you've shared today. Uh, these tips and strategies will certainly help our teachers and all our education professionals in enhancing emotional intelligence in their respective schools, homes, communities, and countries. Uh, we'd just like to get your final message for our audience on how they can uh, continuously enhance emotional intelligence in and out of the classroom. Uh, let's start with Eileen. Uh, your final message for our audience, please. Remember that the time is special. We are in an unusual time. We're living in an unusual time. So um, the emotions of our students, um, can uh, we need to support them emotionally. We need to be there for them. So the, it is important to give them validation. It is important to have different, various kinds of activities. Um, be creative in your activities. Be, be creative in your assessment. Um, it's not just intellectual. It's the, the entire people, the, the entire person. You're assessing the entire person. Assess the entire person. What is their condition now? So 
um, be there for your um, your students. But first of all, in order to be positive educators, we have to take care and be positive towards our own selves. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, Andrew, your final message for audience. Final people. message? Well, um, technology is going to kill a lot of jobs. Uh, to, yesterday, we had journalists. Today, anybody can be a journalist on social media. Uh, yesterday, we had cab drivers. Today, we got grab drivers. Anybody can who has a car can become a cab driver. Yesterday, we had hotels. Today, anybody can go on Airbnb and uh, and, and run a hotel business. Uh, we're going to, a lot of jobs are going to be uh, taken over. And um, you can be very intelligent, but the one thing that's going to make a difference is your EQ because EQ will teach you perseverance. It will help you to be, 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 you'll be motivated, self-motivated. You're aware of your strengths and weaknesses. You know how to maximize on your strengths and how to deal with your weaknesses. You know how to uh, work with people. You know how to empathize with people. You will, you will definitely succeed a lot better than just being an intelligent person. And that's why EQ is very important. Well said. Once again, thank you very much, Andrew and Eileen. And we look forward to having you again in one of our uh, Acad Asia events that truly aim to empower educators everywhere. Uh, I would also like to personally thank all the teachers, administrators, student affairs professionals, counselors, ed tech specialists, guardians, parents, and and all our guests who have joined us today. Thank you for being very active during our fireside chat and for expressing your gratitude also to our guest panelists, Eileen and Andrew, uh, and to Akad Asia, our global learning and networking community. Your support for Akad Asia is most appreciated and we will continue to serve you with top quality online professional development courses and webinars like this to help you become the best 21st century educator that you can be. Uh, dear teachers and other uh, members in the audience, in order for you to get the certificate of attendance, you're all invited to go to www.freeju.com to access and complete the online course entitled Emotional Intelligence at Work. On top of what Andrew and Eileen have shared, there are so much more to learn about emotional intelligence. And you can get them from our online course on the platform. If you don't have an account yet, please go ahead and sign up. It's totally free. While you're there, please take time to explore all the other courses that will help you become an excellent 21st century teacher. Andrew actually was, uh, uh, also has another course on, on cultural intelligence. And, and, and uh, it gives you practical tips and advice uh, and, and very useful information also about how to enhance your cultural intelligence. So while you're on Freeju, please go ahead and uh, take a look at that course and enroll in it as well. So the courses and content that you will find on Freeju are divided into several tracks. You will find courses on pedagogy, technology, wellness, cyber safety, leadership, communication, and STEAM. So there's something for everyone. Do take advantage of this wonderful opportunity to be part of the fast-growing Acad Asia community. So please feel free to send us a message, uh, dear teachers, should you have requests for partnership, inquiries about getting on Freeju, or how you simply want to become a much better teacher or education professional. Once again, Eileen and Andrew, thank you very much for thank being you. with us this afternoon and for uh, giving our teachers and our audience so much uh, to learn uh, about emotional intelligence. To all our teachers and those who have been supporting Akadesha, thank you once again and please stay safe, everyone. Until next Be week safe. for our next webinar. Bye bye and thank bye. you. Hi. I am Jenny and welcome to Free Jew, the global community of educators. Let me show you why as an educator you should make Free Jew an important part of your teaching and learning practice. A community of teaching practice is important for any educator. On Free Jew you will be able to access CollabEd, which is like LinkedIn but for educators. Here you will be able to connect and network with other educators from all around the world. 
you can build your own community of teaching practice and or join one of the many other existing groups and learn and share ideas, lesson plans, etc. with each other. Then, for a more formalized approach to professional development, you can go to SkillEd, which is like Netflix for educators. Here, you will be able to access a wide range of courses designed by global experts that will help you to learn about new pedagogical, technical, and soft skills, all related to 21st century education and the future of work. There are more than 20 courses available for free and for more advanced level courses, you can upgrade to the Silver Membership Plan for just 20 US dollars per year and get access to all courses designed by Acadasia. The courses are available in English and in several other Asian languages. And what's more you will receive a free verifiable and tamper-proof digital certificate for each course that you complete. If you have upgraded your membership to the Silver, Gold, or Platinum plans, you also get access to DesignEd, which is like Canva for educators. Here you will find the easiest and fastest way to practice your own instructional design skills and build your own courses. We have pre-integrated several third-party edtech apps like Flipgrid, Canva, Mentimeter, Padlet, H5P, Zoom, etc. right into Freeju so you can make your courses engaging and fun for your own learners. As you can see, there is a lot you can do on Freeju as an educator. So what are you waiting for? Go to www.freeju.com and get your very own free lifetime membership today. See you soon on Freeju.